what's going on, buddy? How's it hanging? How's it happening? Because you guys know what it is. This is Kevin from the Code Progression Podcast. Potomac City rocks for rock and metal thrive. It's another special Wednesday episode, y'all. It is February 24th, and this one, well, this one's we're looking into the future, where I got to sit down with American Teeth. And singer-songwriter Elijah to go all over this stuff with the future because America's Eve has this rock-pop fusion to their music. And what we really look at in this episode is how this pop-rock fusion is really taking hold now, especially following MGK, Six to My Downfall, and other pop artists really jumping into the foray of rock and metal a little bit. And seeing how the younger generation is really starting to really begin to take hold on some of this stuff. And how American Teeth is kind of going to be in the forefront of that along with the fact that the social media game that they have and the plant they have is absolutely incredible. So if you're looking to have an idea of like what to do on social media with Instagram and TikTok, now this is the podcast for you because this guy is incredibly intelligent with how this is working. And this was an incredibly fun conversation to have as I'm always interested in this stuff. I hope you are too. I know you are because you're listening to stuff. So are you ready? Let's go. Yeah. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners of the Chord Progression Podcast, you know I like all kinds of music, rock or metal, whatever kind of other inspirations they have going on there, alt rock, pop rock, whatever it might be. When Adam Splitter, got my guy Tim over there, sent me this stuff, it was a rock pop fusion style. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Let's take a look. And after listening to their latest song, I thought, you know what? Let's see if we can get him on the podcast. So please welcome American Teeth to the podcast. So American Teeth, a.k.a. Elijah, welcome to Core Progression Podcast, man. What's good? How's everything going out there? Are you in uh, California right now, I think? Yes. Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. Awesome. How's everything going out there so far? Dude, it's cold and rainy, which is rare. It's been gloomy. <laughs> okay, I got to ask you this question then. What is cold in your uh, in your mind in L.A.? Cold in LA for me is like 45. It's been like 45. So that's that's cold for me. But I'm I grew up in Maine, so I'm used to like way colder. And I lived in Chicago, so I'm used to like negative zero Fahrenheit, you know, below zero Fahrenheit. So I've that's just good. changed. Yeah, yeah, I was <laughs> gonna say, like, changed. wait a minute, 45, that doesn't sound cold. But if you if you grew up in Maine and you also lived in Chicago for a period of time, then when it comes to cold weather, you and I are pretty much on the same wave wavelength because I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So not no. too far away. So, yeah, I know. I mean, I look outside right now. There's like 10 inches of snow on the ground. The roads are still uh, pretty snow covered. If I wanted to go sliding all over the place in the snow, I easily could. I have done that before. I haven't done the full, like, you know, get into a nice wide intersection, try and do a full 360 and then turn on that. But, eh, you know, I don't want to ruin my car. Dude, I used to do that. I had a like a pickup truck, for, like a 1994 Toyota uh, like stick shift pickup truck. And I used to like bring it to my high school parking lot and I used to just do donuts in the parking lot in the snow. It's so fun. I actually, when I was, I had a full-time job, this was back in 2019 cause I was working for this company just, uh, West, uh, a suburb West of Milwaukee. And I don't, if I get there in the morning early enough, the plows hadn't come through yet. And there were a couple of people already there. All of a sudden you see me, I'm like, well, I didn't really like that job at all. So I wanted to have some fun before I had to go into work and have to deal with eight and a half hours of a bunch of crap. So you'd see me doing donuts in the parking lot for like 10 minutes. And then the plows would come and look at me and think, what the hell is this kid actually doing? And there's me just going, doing all these donuts, listening to Marilyn Manson, because I think it's hilarious. Also with the windows rolled down, just going, the beautiful people. The beautiful yeah, yeah. People. <laughs> just catching an adrenaline rush. Just it definitely woke me up. So when I went into work that day, I'm like, you know what? This is going like, to be an all right day. Yeah. Instead of just that, you know, zombie like. Uh, Drudging through the day. Pretty much. Yeah. But I'm, I mean, I'm happy that you understand what uh, what cold is and how much fun you can have in it with just a wide open parking lot, a bunch of snow and a vehicle. Yes. So, but, but as we jump into it, I want to get my audience to really know a little bit more about you. So I want to introduce yourself with three things. I always ask these three questions and I want to see the two, first two, I should say, are always the easiest. The last one though, ooh, that's my favorite. So the first two questions, I want to know what your name is and what you do in the band or what you do with American Teeth. And the third thing is my favorite. I want to know that little, like a little fun fact, a little fun story about yourself. However, I want it to be the wackiest fact or the wackiest story you can think of. I've heard 
all these different random ones I've heard of band members chloroforming each other and driving out into the beach and burying them like halfway in the sand and like covering like the part that's not buried in ketchup to make it look like they cut off their legs. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other crazy ones. I've heard of people's famous uh, Twitter cats and Twitter dogs. I've heard a story about how someone was the most famous YouTuber in Sweden at one point and then PewDiePie came along. So he pretty much took a huge backseat to that. So whatever you got, man, go for it. Man, okay. Um, Elijah Knoll from South Portland, Maine. Um, yeah, I'm the singer and writer and uh, producer for American Teeth. I um, I would say I uh, mainly songwriting and singing now. Um, and yeah, uh, stories. Let's see. I, I have plenty of stories. It's just it's a matter of how many of them I remember. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um. I don't know. Okay. Maybe like a surprising fact about me that most people wouldn't know is that um, I studied classical violin starting when I was two years old for like 15 years. Really? Yeah. Uh, was it something that, I mean, the two years old, I'm pretty sure that's something that your parents wanted you to get into and try. I would, I would have to assume that. I don't think that like as a two-year-old, you'd want to pick up a violin unless you were like uh, the next reincarnation of Mozart. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, it definitely was my mom's doing, but like, do you remember like those old Disney VHSs with the plastic cases? Oh yeah. My parents still have a bunch of those. Cause it's when you have, when you and your brother have grandkids and we have the Disney movies to watch, even though they're on VHS and we don't have a VHS player in my parents' house anymore, but also they have like the classic little label on there. So if you want yep. to resell them, you could resell them for a pretty good price right now. But I think they're also yeah. holding on just in case, you know, I want to actually resell them. Those are definitely collector's items at this point. But we used when I first started, I learned how to hold a violin with one of those plastic cases and a pencil, like just to figure out how to like hold it. And like, you know, it's crazy. That was like, you know, because if I dropped like a real violin, then that, you know, those, even the small ones are expensive. But my first violin was literally like you can't people can't see it, but it was like the width of my like head probably or like, you know, shoulders. So it's basically Very it's like, small. oh, let me play you a song in the world's smallest violin. You could literally pull that violin out and it would work. It's at my mom's house. So I could actually access the world's smallest <laughs> violin or at least my my world's smallest violin. Now, with the Disney cover thing, was that something that your parents came up with to get you to uh, learn how to hold it? Or was that something that you came up with on your own? No, nah, that was my violin teacher at the time. That's still a smart move, though, because those cases yeah. were rather bulky. They were bulky and like indestructible, I feel like. Yeah, it was it was weird because like the plastic on them was hard, but it was also a little bit flexible th at times. So you could bend it, you could crush it and they just end up like popping back to its original form. Yeah. And like they were kind of the edges were kind of sharp, if I remember correctly. Oh, like, little you know bit. how it like juts out around the side and you're just like, it's like kind of sharp. I don't know. Yeah, I'm it was like just remembering because it was they weren't like they weren't like sharp corners. Either. They were rounded because, of course, kids are going to be using them. So you don't want them to like poke their mm -hmm. eye out. However, yeah, the way that they were, they were. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they were really thin. And it's just they were if you press them against your hand, like, you know, you would definitely feel it. So it wasn't something like, oh, it's just round. Like, no, you, it was thin. So it would put a good amount of pressure on you. Yeah, it's crazy. Man, and, and look Antiques. at how far we, I'll say, look at how far we've come because those those like big bulky VHS tapes were very popular in the 90s. And all of a sudden, now you look at it 2020 and no one's got <laughs> no one had, does anything with VHS tapes. No one does anything with DVDs. Blu-rays are pretty much non-existent anymore. And everything is just uh, streamed online. Yeah. Crazy. No physical anything. No physical anything, even with music as well, except, well, vinyls kind of is making a comeback, though. It's more of the nostalgic thing. And it's so cool to just spin some vinyl records. I can attest that I've got a vinyl collection, probably about like 40 or 50 records down there. I always play them on this bad boy right here. Damn, really nice. Get... I got to get one of those. That's one thing that I'm missing in my apartment. It's it. I I really like it because all of a sudden, like, I'll just be sitting here. I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't want to actually like just I'm working on my computer. I've got like 10, 10 different things running right now. If I start playing something off of iTunes right here, I'm like, I'm just going to fry my computer at this point. Just put on the vinyl, see what happens. All of a sudden I start spinning like uh, start spinning wolves from Rise Against. I'm just like, OK, I'm having a good time now. That's sick. Yeah, it's like, I would definitely suggest get one. It's still kind of it's still a cool thing to have, like the physical copies of music, but also like how like just the bigger style of it it's thin 
it's wide, but you get the full album artwork on there. You get to see how is it actually intended to be. Yeah, and people are probably still putting credits and stuff on them, right? I would assume so. Like yeah. liner notes and stuff. Like, I gotta make I, you know, I gotta so make me, a a vinyl for my album. I'll say, let me see. Let me just pull out one. I'm gonna pull out uh this one. I'm pulling out Homesick from a Day to Remember. Oh, sick. Yeah, got the whole entire like note sheet yeah. with all the lyrics. Fire and lyrics. Yeah, and then you've got the. Uh, list of the who the guys that made it you've got the songs written by all the credits and then who the, who all the guys wanted to thank for making this record so is my boy colin Britton on that one on this one um I don't, it looks like there's a lot of information there so i don't know if you can catch it off the bat but there is i'm listed as producer at least produ- on something. i don't know i just know he works with them he just put out their latest single with them and he's he's a the primary producer for american teeth Ooh, that's that's awesome. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> I mean, that, we, uh, we started this project together. That's still pretty dang cool, though. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, he's he's super talented. But yeah, I'm taking a look at this one right now. He is not on this one. However, again, this is Home Six. It was from 2009. I mean, this album's a little, right. like 12 years old at this point. So yeah, he might not have been involved by then. <laughs> yeah, I could. The only the only other one that I have older than this one right now is What Separates Me from You. I could always quickly check that one, but. Yeah. yeah, you know, not sure. Why not? It's yeah, just, if it's close, check it. Shout I mean, I out, them, Colin Britton. I mean, I have them all right here. So let's see. We got. Is that they got this? Stuff. Let's see. Not there. I'm gonna put that up here. So they got a little book for this one. It looks like. So oh, that's cool. Got. I like that each one is a little different. And how uh, good does it feel to like, you know, physically like flip through shit and like take shit out and like put it yeah like i feel it's, like that's the coolest thing about vinyl it honestly feels really nice just due to the fact that you have this full this actual thing and i've spoken about this beforehand too which is why i like when it comes to streaming why there's le- why a lot of people are going more focused on the singles and we're going a lot further away from the album is just because when you put the singles out there it's like okay here's the one thing and if it's gonna hit or if it's gonna miss and it just if it hits, then people are going to want to look into more. If it misses, people are going to want to look at less. And they want to do that. So like with a full album cycle, it's easier for you to try and get to like something. However, with a full album, when you actually buy it, whether it's you download it like an MP3 style, you buy a CD, you buy a vinyl, it's an actual physical thing. You want to get the return on that investment. So you're going to listen to the whole thing. You're really going to try and digest it to get the most out of it that you can. Totally. So like even taking a look at this, I mean, they've got... So I'll say this. They've got all the lyrics on every single song but they're like they look like they're handwritten that you can see oh, that's that. fire yeah love that so that's actually kind of cool so it's like instead of actually having to like look up the lyrics online to some of these songs if i have them here hey i can actually look up and see uh the lyrics for second suck so whenever jeremy's going super duper unclean i can be like oh shit here we go i know what i'm <laughs> i know what he's saying and it's in his handwriting yes that's really dope yeah, the only other thing I have like that I know it, that's not in the vinyl that is in someone's handwriting is I got this little card that has the handwritten lyrics. I think it just was written once, but then copied a bunch of times. It was in a box I got a merch box from uh, F- Falling in Reverse, so I have the like a copy of like a handwritten lyric sheet from Ronnie Radke for Popular Monster. It's that's sitting bad. in a lamp right over on like the other side of the room. <laughs> nice. I didn't know where else to put it. <laughs> that's great. You got a nice collection. Oh, there you! Oh, there's so much other crap around here that's not even seen on camera. Like, there's a couple. I got a, like three posters right above my desk here. One's an Ice Nine Kills one. I got a Rise Against one. I do have a, a Day to Remember one when they did the whole House of Blues tour with uh, Under Oath. Oh yeah, and I've got another signed Rise Against one. Got two skateboard decks from bands I've had in the podcast. A giant uh, Thirty Seconds of Mars slash American flag. I've got a couple other posters over there, over on the other wall over here. A flag that is the Jerusalem or the uh, Israel flag, but it has the disturbed logo on it. Cause they made that when they went to Israel, I've got a signed fine. drum cover from the band King collapse. So I've had in the podcast before and then a signed vinyl album. The only one I have never played in the player because it is the, the print on it is the album cover for this disturbed second album. And it's signed by all four guys. So I'm like, I'm framing that that's not being played. <laughs> nah, I'll keep that crispy. Oh yeah. <clears throat> and it's like, well, you ever going to sell that? Nah, no, that's staying on the wall. That's mine. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So instead of me talking about my this whole entire vinyl thing, vinyl collection, and the coolness that you know when you actually have the physical copy of them, again, I suggest if you want to get a vinyl player, go for it. Get something that actually is high quality to it because 
you don't want to cheap out on something like that. Yeah, I've heard that same advice. I think that's good advice. It's kind of like anything with, well, with especially with music as well. And I mean, you can attest to this as well. It's when you're doing something with it, you want to make sure it has the best quality possible. Definitely. If you're going to spend the money, just spend a little extra and get the good one. That's going to be high quality. Because you don't, because one other thing too is, is if you think about it, what do you, what's going to end up resonating with people more when you save a couple of bucks and put it out there, but it comes through a little bit scratchy or spend the extra amount of money, make sure it comes through crisp, clean, the way you want it to sound. And then more people get into it. Yeah, totally. And I mean, taking a listen to your, some of your music as well. I got to pull, I had, I had, I was listening to it earlier. I had the Spotify look, uh, stats up, but then I had to quickly listen to something else. I forgot what I was listening to. I think I was listening to some spirit box stuff, but taking a look at American teeth right now on Spotify, as we're recording this, when it comes to quality, when the fact that you have a monthly listener count at 224,000, that's speaking to the point where this music is definitely quality behind it to, again, what we were talking about. You don't want to go cheap on this stuff. You want to make sure that it's the best possible when you're expressing yourself, when you're expressing yourself through your music, trying to tell a story, whatever it might be. You want to make sure it's the best possible. Yeah, man. Thank you. Appreciate that. So one other thing I got to ask before we really dive deep into is because I believe in the whole entire press release that I saw, this was kind of another project that you're working on as well. Were you working on something else alongside this with American Teeth or is this, you know, now your main focus? This is my main focus for sure. Um, before I was doing American Teeth, I was d- just going by Elijah Noel. I had a solo project and some of it, I, a lot of it I was producing on my own and collaborating with a couple of producers here and there on that. Um, but uh, yeah, then I linked up with Colin Britton and and that's kind of how American Teeth started. Um, and yeah, throughout this process of of getting all of that going, I've also been uh, writing as a songwriter for other bands and other artists as well. Man, you're just like a jack of all trades at this point where <laughs> you're working on your own stuff. You're, you've got this whole entire project going, but you're also collaborating with a bunch of other producers and artists as well to really expand your footprint in the music industry at this point. Yeah, man. And I really like to collaborate in general. So I feel like I'm, you know, well suited for that type of situation. What other um, artists have you collaborated with up to this point? I've collaborated with um, um, I've collaborated with Dreamers, if you've heard of them. Um, Twin XL, I put a song out with them. Uh, uh, Little Hurt, who is a friend of ours as well. He uh, used to be in the Mowgli's. He was a singer for the Mowgli's, if you remember that band. Oh, yeah. um, uh, my friend Only Child, who used to be called The Ready Set. I collaborate with him. Uh, no Love for the Middle Child. Uh, I got a song, uh, I wrote a song for, uh, and with, uh, Elenium and, uh, Tom DeLong, which is crazy. Okay. The fact that you got to write a song with Tom DeLong is just absolutely incredible. <laughs> Unfortunately it was in the pandemic, so it wasn't in person and I wish it was, but, um, that was epic. That song was called paper thin. But one other thing, too, is when it comes to the whole entire thing with the pandemic, there's a lot of people that began to collaborate with artists that they probably never would have collaborated with if it wasn't for the pandemic, wasn't for having to find different ways to create music, be creative. I mean, I've heard bands, all other bands that have been able to collaborate with artists all through Zoom. I mean, probably the biggest one that I know that did that, that I've had in the podcast for is a band called Saul, where with their song King of Misery was big on Octane, especially towards the end of 2020. They wrote that all over Zoom alongside uh, David Draymond from Disturbed. So, but That's if, sick, yeah. But if you think about it, it's if it wasn't for the pandemic, if it wasn't for these artists having the time to really work on some of these different ideas, work on some of these different songs, you people would never have, have uh, collaborated with some of the artists that they did, much like you collaborating with Tom DeLonge on this. Yeah, it's pretty insane. Definitely a, a childhood dream come true, man. I love Blink-182. I was just about to ask him, like, please tell me it's a childhood dream come true that you like Blink-182 because it, all of a sudden just writing with him and just probably trying to have to keep in check kind of that, like, holy shit, I'm right with Tom DeLong. Yeah, yeah. It took me a second to, like, fully accept that that was real. <laughs> I was like, uh, okay, fuck yeah, bro. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like you can kind of hear some of that influence in my music, too. 
a little bit with the way that it flows and kind of with a little more of that upbeat style. Mm-hmm. Be- because, of course, you listen to Blink-182 stuff, especially you listen to anything off of, like, Dude Ranch or Enema of the State. It's going to have mm-hmm. more of this upbeat feel to a lot of that, like, like real uh, beginning style of pop punk, especially when it was really prominent in the early 2000s. And totally. because it always kind of had this, it, it like, at points, you know, in times, it kind of talked about some more of that, like, more depressive, more emo kind of stuff. However, when it was really pop punk, like, there's always a sort of energy behind it, which is why people really gravitated towards it. Definitely. I mean, I still remember this, uh, like when I was in like middle school, like middle school dances, like all of a sudden they're playing music and it's like, uh, you know, they're playing some of the hip hop stuff. I wasn't really that big into it, but all of a sudden you start hearing something like, uh, Ocean Avenue by Yellow Card or I'm trying yes. to think what else they would play, uh, Shake It by Metro Transit. Metro I'm just like, Station, Metro Station, yep. Metro Transit. Oh, okay. There's my first mess up of the day, but <laughs> it's okay. But like, listen, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is perfect. And then all of a sudden they're going to play something else. I'm like, I have no idea what the song is. Can you go back to the pop punk or just like maybe uh, if they ever played the G note and all of a sudden, you know, start hearing MCR going on there. I'm like, see, now that would have been awesome, but they never did that. They never took my request. Yeah. Yeah. That one's that one's a tough one for school dances. But I but I respect you uh, requesting that one. <laughs> oh, I've got a crazy story that in regards to um, what or welcome Black Parade with my, my chemical romance where. It was New Year's Eve 2018 going to New Year's Day 2019, and it was 1130 at night, but half hour before New Year, and I was ended up completely alone on North Ave in Milwaukee. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm all by myself right now. It's half hour before New Year's. End up going to a bar that my friend was working at in downtown Milwaukee. And there were there were there was a good amount of people there, but there weren't that many people there. And it was right before midnight. And I'm like, dude, give me the aux cord. I've got an idea. I planned this out so. I figured out when the time was going to hit. I pulled out my iPod. I literally stuck the aux cord in there and I just hit play. And all of a sudden I started playing Welcome to the Black Parade. People were wondering, why the hell are you playing this? All of a sudden you start really getting into it. The bar was going nuts. And I had it timed out to where when the chorus hits for the last time, it turned midnight. And people were trying to like flood the bar because they even opened the windows, just blasting this throughout the whole entire. (laughs) And people were leaving other bars just to try and get in and just to celebrate. So I'm like, I did good today. And That's then after epic. afterwards, everyone's like, oh, yeah, happy new year. Everyone's hugging each other. I'm sitting in the bar. Yeah, I did good. But now I'm all <laughs> alone. You set the whole vibe for the changing of the year. I really did. And it was, a, I mean, it was a, going into 2019. So MCR came back. I did something good here. Good work. You can take the credit for that, maybe. <laughs> I will take full credit Speaking for that. Speaking of that, because I'm excited about this, I'm playing on the same day at Aftershock Festival as... My Chemical Romance. When are you? In are really? Really? Yep. I, it's another another childhood dream coming true. Holy shit. Okay. I got to quickly look this up. It's Saturday on at Aftershock. Yeah. In October. And I saw it when I saw it <laughs> release. I had no idea that this was going to happen, to be honest. And then I got the news and it's, yeah, the, the headliners that night are My Chemical Romance and Machine Gun Kelly, which is crazy. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I just pulled it up. So the day that you're going to be playing, because you're on the bill, I'm looking at it right now. It's just, yeah, My Chemical Romance as the big headliner. But then you also have The Offspring, MGK, mm-hmm. Gojira, and still a question, 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 question mark reunion. My guess is going to be Mudvayne, honestly. That's going to okay. be my guess. Uh, then you also have Anthrax. Of course, it's always a classic for any kind of uh, hard rock or metal music festival. Kill Switch Engage, Yes. Yeah. Asking Alexandria, Body Count, Bad Flower, Thursday L7, Atreyu, Bones UK, Alien Weaponry, South of Eden, The Black Moods, Another Day Dawns, another good band. If you ever get if you get a chance to check them out, go do that. And then of course, check out this one, American Teeth. Yeah. I'm probably the least like hard rock act on that whole bill. Like it's like me and MGK <laughs> maybe are like at the bottom of like the heavy. <laughs> spectrum yeah i mean like i'm looking through some looking through some more of them now and I'm just taking a look at it it's like it, bad it, it, flower I can, bad flower is is similar vibe to me yeah bad flower has a similar vibe to you guys to you as well taking a look at some of the other ones as well because of course you're going to have the two days where metallica is headlining and yeah. oh maybe i should yeah maybe i should try and find my way out there for uh for aftershock because i definitely would be want to be there both saturday and sunday Dude, you should. On Thursday, Limp Biscuit just got added too, which is crazy. Yeah, Limp Biscuit, Parkway Drive, Testament, Hatebreed, Exodus, Knocked Loose, and Fit for a King. Yeah. Dude, I'd like to go see Fit for a King, and they put on a good show. There's a lot of good acts on that fest. 
Oh yeah, I'm taking a look at like your sun, like the Sunday day too. And there's a bunch I'd want to go and see. Uh, for Mashes to New, I've had them on the podcast before, and I'd like to go see them play live. Uh, Black Veil Brides, Steel Panther, Pretty Reckless, Pennywise. However, I know at some point in time I'd be like stuck on a stage because Rise Against is playing. And I'm not missing another show. Oh, dude. Yeah, I can already tell you, uh, you really, you heavily fuck with Rise Against. I, I have since ever since I was like 14 years old and I haven't changed since. Amazing. They're rad, man. They got some good songs. I'm just, I'm looking forward to 2021. Cause I'm like, I'm hoping like they haven't put out new albums in 2017. Like I'm hoping for something new here, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. As long as, cool. as long as the pandemic like comes to an end, we can actually get back to playing live shows. And I, we, you, we can get back to getting you on stage. We can get back yep. to me, get hurt in mosh pits. Everybody will be happy. Hell yeah, dude. I can't wait to crowd surf again. But, okay, so now I got to ask you this when it comes to uh, Aftershock. How did you get on the bill for this? Because I know there's a lot of bands that are probably clawing and trying to get on something like this with the Danny Wimmer Presents Festival. And the fact that you got a spot on there, not only that, but like taking a look at the poster, because I know a lot of times they put the and more at the back end of it, but American Teeth is squarely on there. Like I'm looking at it right now. So yeah. how did you get on this bill? Dude, I, I think it was my booking agent. Um, <laughs> it's a little unclear. It was either my booking agent or my label, Fearless Records. Um, but I'm very lucky to have been, you know, selected for the fest regardless. I'm not, to be honest, I don't know exactly how it happened. My manager texted me the picture, like the, the picture of it and was like, you're playing a festival next October. And I was like, let's fucking go. <laughs> I'm so like, I have like a fucking beacon of light of hope to just like, look forward to all year which has been helpful for me oh it easily is and like when you see that picture the first thing you're just kind of like oh gotta play like the exactly. halo three music and just really add to the epicness that is it that's oh. essentially how it felt <laughs> however shout out to your booking agent or who or to uh fearless records as well for whoever made this happen because that is absolutely incredible I don't know who your booking agent is, but if it was you, shout out. But I know Fearless Records, they've got a lot of great bands in their arsenal. And I love the music that the bands under their label put out. So, yeah, you definitely got put under a good label there. Trust me on that. Yeah, they're so great, man. The, the tours I've seen with like some of their bands, I'm just basically every single time I see one, I'm blown away by it. However, I haven't seen one in over a year because of uh, uh, COVID. COVID yeah <laughs> but um do you have any other like potential shows in the works right now for 2021 outside of aftershock fest due to the fact that of course i know everything going on with the pandemic right now a lot of things are uncertain but because you said like this was the year like that one like beacon of hope thing for the rest of the year is there any other things with live shows that you have is that beacon of hope style I wish, dude. I haven't had any other offers besides that, just because I don't think they're booking anything, at least in the U.S. right now that I know of. Um, but I'm hoping that next winter, like I think that starting next fall, things are going to start opening up. I'm just going to be optimistic here and say that maybe I'll do a festival in, in Europe at least next winter or something like that somewhere overseas, because I think they'll probably open up quicker than we will, which is, you know, just that's my guess. And the fact that you got a, again good booking agent and a good label behind you as well, that's going to help out tremendously, especially if you're going to try and get something over in Europe. And the fact that you do have the aftershock thing in your back pocket, as well as a little bit of a what's the proper word, like a pump up in a way. It's like, yeah, hey, I'm on this bill. Get can I be on your bill too? Yeah, man. It's like, it's like, it's like the stepping up the stairs, one step at a time. You get one in your pocket, and then you're like, hey, put me on this next one, and then on that ladder exactly and i mean that'd be absolutely incredible to see you on some of those bills as well and when it comes to just what you talk about where it looks like there's a lot of venues right now where especially the more independent venues not the festivals they aren't booking anything right now because of the uncertainty however with the festivals it's the reason why we know all the acts that are pretty much there is because a lot of the ones that were going to be playing in 2020 at those festivals that of course had to get uh canceled Pretty much most of those bands and most of those lineups got pushed back one year. So that's pretty much why you're seeing a lot of that stuff still stick out as of this moment with a lot of the Danny, like the Danny Moore Presents Festival, Riot Fest in Chicago. I'll always mention that because that's one of my favorites. 
uh, yeah. Rock Fest here in Wisconsin, Rock on the Range. I'm trying to think of – there's so many others, though. I can't think of all of them. <laughs> Dude, I definitely have to play Riot Fest. I, I went there a couple times when I lived in Chicago, and it was sick. When they were when they were doing it at uh, Humboldt Park. I don't know if they're still doing it at Humboldt Park. Um, let, me, let me take a look at the poster. Uh, in 2019, they did it at Douglas Park. Okay. So the years that I went, I think both years it was at Humboldt, or at least one of them. Cause I lived near, I like lived in the neighborhood. And so I was able to just like walk straight from my house and I was like, fuck yeah. So you have to worry about parking. You already had it covered. Yep. It was awesome. It's lucky. I, cause of course living in Milwaukee, I have to, I get down there somehow and I end up driving down there. And when I parked, I'm like, I got to look for a spot to park, just try and find something. And all of a sudden I couldn't find everything. It was like 50 bucks or, or more. I'm like, this sucks. And I yeah. ended up uh, finding someone that was like, yeah, we're letting people park in like our alley if you want to. I'm like, How much? 20 bucks. Um, that's cheaper than 50. So they had me park Smart. like bo- like behind two electrical poles and a- in between a- and in between a fence. So I'm like, I'm like stuck in here. I'm like, um, let's just see how this happens. I gave them 25. By the time I came back, like my car, like nothing had happened. I saw a bunch of other cars gone. So I'm like, I didn't know if they got towed or if all of a sudden, I know there's a lot that people were also selling spots in and I saw the tow trucks go in there. I'm like, I'm glad I got in this random weird spot. I'm like, that f- extra five bucks went a long way. Yeah, bro, you finessed. Hey, man, you learn some things about when you go to a bunch of these different festivals. It's just, hey, you know, we're just going to throw a little money here, throw a little money there, see what happens. Just take care of everybody. Have a good time. Exactly. That's the mentality. And then, uh, but one of the things I liked about with Riot Fest, and if you ever get a chance to play, I mean, you, you've been there before, but. Yeah. It's just how how just absolutely insane. Every like the stages are gigantic. They had like especially at Douglas Park, they had everything spread out except for their two biggest stages were next like side by side with each other, which was kind of nice though because then if you were if like because uh, Slayer was the headliner of the night I went, so it was everyone was kind of gravitating towards the main stages as well. However, before Slayer went on on their stage, the other stage was going. It had Rise Against down there, and it was the most packed stage before Slayer. So I was like, oh man, this is awesome. And I thought, oh, maybe I should leave early to go get a closer spot for Slayer. Nah. Yeah. Nah. Nah, I'm just uh, Yeah. No, that's cool that they do it right next to each other. You can hop back and forth. It, it was. Unfortunately, like, they ha- also had, like, the fence in between there so security personnel could be in there. So you did have to walk past. It. You had to walk back, pat, like, be on the sound booth and then loop around. But it wasn't that far of a walk. However, with how many people were there, like, right when uh, all the – all the shows right all the shows right before Slayer went on ended like everyone was already gravitating towards us so just trying to move around was uh yeah it was tough but I miss it yeah yeah man it'll come back it'll be back it'll it'll be back and we'll see what happens but there's actually something that now like is also taking a look at the aftershock lineup as well because you're on the same day as the same day as MGK and listening to your music as well, because you definitely have more of that. You definitely have a rock, but pop fusion in there. And look with what MGK had done in 2020 with tickets to my downfall, kind of bringing that pop punk flavor back to the, back into the forefront. Of course, with Travis Barker on almost every single one of those tracks as well, which was a major help because it really had that, like it kind of had a little bit of that Blink-182 flow, but it really sure. had that great like pop punk energy behind it. And I'm starting to see other like pop artists starting to try and like talk about foreign and rock and metal. We saw Youngblood do it with uh, Obey with Bring Me the Horizon. We saw Halsey do it with, of course, Being on Forget Me Too with MGK. We saw Miley Cyrus wanting to do cover, like a Metallica cover album. And I've talked with other bands about this, but I want to get your take on this as well. And especially with you being having like that rock pop fusion sound, do you think with, especially with someone like MGK, and the prominence that he has working with something more of the rock genre, do you think that's going to bring a lot more kids that are more into that pop and hip hop genre over to rock and potentially metal? And also because you have that rock pop fusion sound, do you think they're going to really come towards you initially on this? Yes. And yes, I think, I think I'm really hyped about the fact that MGK is bringing it to the mainstream because I make music that is, that is very pop inspired. So and and also rock inspired so it's like it it definitely works out in my favor um and i do think that that we would share and will share like a lot of you know similar fans but um yeah i'm i love that you know pop music is really merging again with rock because it was very much hand in hand back in the early 2000s and and all that so it's like i'm i'm just stoked that that's back 
The same here, just because it's especially like take a look at like the last five years, like take a look, or say like 2015, 2019, when it came to a lot of the rock and metal stuff, it was still known. However, it was a lot of the more younger and upcoming bands were still being kind of drowned out by the heavy hitters in the scene where it was I, a lot of the bands that I have found out about and I've really come to like. I had no idea they even existed back in, I would say, like 2016, 2017. Like for me, yeah. it's just, I, 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 of course I knew about Rise Against, of course I knew about Disturbed, but I had no idea about Motionless and White. I had no idea about Ice Nine Kills. I didn't really listen to A Day to Remember at all. Uh, I didn't listen to any really a Bring Me the Horizon at all. I didn't even know who Architects was. All of a sudden, like a couple of years later, now I'm just like, how the hell do people not know about this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man, there's a lot of good stuff out there. And this is coming to light. Yeah. And I've talked with other bands as well that also have that like rock pop influence in there as well. And listening to the music, because I one thing I always want to do is especially I want to do a deep dive into your music as well, just to really understand to see how that's going to work. And with the sound that you have, especially on something like Barn Out, it definitely can fit in with that style that is going to be where kids that are really more into pop and hip hop, if they're going to try and get more into rock as well, where are they going to start? Like, this is where they're going to go to first. Definitely. Yeah. I love that. The idea of people kind of bridging their way into a, a, a different genre that they wouldn't normally be into. I think that's oh, cool. Absolutely. I mean, I can, I mean, I've, I've done the same thing with like metalcore because I never really liked unclean screams before in music at all. All of a sudden, I start like slowly listening to some stuff. I listen to Ra- Ra- Architects of the Holy Hell of, and I really like the construction of it. So I was like, holy shit. And then all of a sudden, I started listening to Motionless and White, and now I'm just a, like a metalcore junkie at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I also think that, you know, in general, people are kind of just open to, to hearing every type of genre being mixed in this big melting pot. And like, then you get these crazy kind of, conjunctions of genres that you wouldn't normally think of because you know everything there's so much out there it's like when so for me what sticks out is when people like blend all kinds of different genres together in their own unique way and I'm like oh that I would have never thought about that that's sick you're adding you're taking like some random like dubstep skrillex like or you know mid 2000s sound like electronic sound like some hyper pop shit with some like like fucking indie guitars and like a hip-hop vocal and like i just think that stuff is so cool yeah and then a great example of that is take a look at what bringing the horizon of the post human survival horror ep kingslayer especially because they're mixing this like metalcore deathcore style at the same time with the japanese j-pop stylings that baby metal uses and at first when I saw that, like the, like that they were featured on the track, my first thought was, how the hell is this going to work? It wasn't me going like, oh my God, this is going to be hard. I'm like, I'm just curious how this is going to work. Listen to the song. And now I'm just thinking, yeah, this works out really well. So again, it's just, you're seeing a lot of different collaborations as well. Like you're seeing what, like someone like Youngblood is doing as well, kind of for into more of this stuff. Again, MGK, where I like, I love the best way that someone described his influences was take a look at a wall and a hot topic in 2008. Look at the t-shirt wall, find all the t-shirts on there. Boom. That's his, uh, that's all his influences. <laughs> that's funny. But it's just something where it's just one other thing too, with the way that streaming is now when the music is consumed, especially on Spotify, Apple music, whatever it might be, especially with the way people are listening to music. It's one thing, like I mentioned earlier, it's if they listen to something, if they listen to a new album, they're going to listen to the first song. And like if the first 10 seconds of that song doesn't really affect them in a certain way, they're going to write off the album completely because they're not invested into it. Mm-hmm. Where, But however, the discovery option is incredible because you're able to just you know get connected almost everything. All of a sudden, your music is going to start getting out. And, oh, you might like, it's like, if you like this artist, you might like American Teeth. It might just whatever it might be. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, people are going to listen to it and they're going to hear more of that rock bass, but they're also hear more of that pop fusion that they're used to. So then they're going to want to listen to it a little bit more to see where this is all going. And then instead of getting that like 10 seconds that everybody else gets, you're getting 30 seconds, you're getting a minute, you're getting a whole song. And if you get the whole song, then you're going to get people to want to listen to even more and more and more and more and more, especially in this first wave that happens. Of course, kids could easily continue to get into the next wave, like all of a sudden more hard rock stuff more metal, whatever it might be. However, the kids are really start, they're going to want to start out with something that they have a connection to. And that's where that oh, yeah. your rock pop fusion really connects with that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. 
um, that that just got me thinking. Like, it, it's funny because I do have such like a, I, I pull from so many different kind of influences, and I just I like all kinds of different music. So I, it my music ends up coming out in this way where like, you know, you kind of it's it, I, I kind of almost want it to be a little unpredictable so like when I drop a new single you're like oh I didn't know there was this side to it and then oh I didn't know there was this side to it so you know my hope is like the singles leading up to an album then you'll kind of like I'll have kind of grabbed people from different places and they'll be like oh wait okay maybe I you know I I, I like this one song but like damn maybe now I like this more like punk track too. Like this one was a little softer, but like, oh damn, he has all this like some heavier shit where he's screaming too. And like, oh, I never really listened to music with screaming, but I fuck with this because I'm already in it, you know? So I'm hoping that that is like part of the experience people have when they find my music. I think that's a great way to put it. Now I got to ask what the influence is with that. Like when I said like MGK with like the Hot Topic t-shirt wall in 2008, like would that be a similar way with you where all of a sudden like you're going to see some like some of these more metal bands, more metalcore bands, also some more of these pop punk bands, some like bands like Sleeping with Sirens or Pierce the Veil. Then you get some like hip hop artists in there as well, some pop artists, whatever it might be. Is that kind of like a good way to describe it as well? Yeah, I and like some kind of more like a little more like indie like stuff. Like I really like the 1975 too. It's a little softer kind of vibe, but like very pop. Like because for me, like if I just am such a pop freak, dude. Like I so I but like. I like heavy shit. I like softer shit. I like hip hop. I like, so I think it just all kinds of kind of comes together in the middle somewhere in some weird ass world that I, that I'm creating. <laughs> <laughs> and I think in all honesty, that gives you a rather good advantage, especially going into the, well, the 2020s, I should say, due to the fact that, you know, we're through 2020. However, again, with what's happened with pop music, what's, with what's happened with MGK, and what's happening on TikTok, where more kids are starting to dive deeper, like more of that pop punk sense. But you're starting yeah. to see that like pop rock fusion really start to take hold a little bit with that younger generation. And of course, we need those younger fans in order to keep the genre going, keep the genre growing. And then to start, you know, get in the garages, start playing in bands or start making music on their own and just get inspired. And when it comes to just having all those different influences, you have a great advantage because you understand different nuances about all those different genres of music. So when it comes to writing your music, especially as a songwriter, you're able to pull from all these different influences and you're able to pick out certain things about maybe hip hop that all of a sudden you're trying to write something that has more of a rock base. But, oh, I wonder how this specific thing in hip hop would work in a rock sense. And yeah. it might not like you might put it in somewhere. And it might not work, however, because you know the construction, you know the base behind it, you know the reason why it's there. You might know, oh, it, in practice, it doesn't work here. But if I move it to this different part of the song, it might be the best thing ever. You never know. But you have that mindset. You have those influences to really drive that uh, creative process forward. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah, it's funny. I like I've met like, you know, family friends and stuff like that who are like younger, like 12 year old kids who are like, oh, dude, I love Green Day. Like they're like li they're like listening to like fucking brain stew and shit like that i'm like that's dope yeah i was like uh with my little cousin too because we were up this is in 2020 we were up north and we were fishing and he was like oh put on some music i'm like well do you want to listen to my music or what do you suggest me i put on he's like eh, you know i kind of like i'm um, kind of like a panic at the disco i'm just thinking i'm not the biggest fan of panic myself but um yeah I'm not going to say no to you listening to the music that I, the style of music that I like. So we're playing some panic while fishing, man. <laughs> That's so funny. I slowly started getting into some other stuff too. Like now he's get like, he's getting into more like Blink-182 fallout boy. The hardest yeah. I've gotten him into is falling in reverse. Which I'm still pretty proud of him. Like, okay, now we're definitely getting somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You got to ease him into it. Right. Oh, oh yeah. All this, I mean, kind of was the same thing with me. However, like when I was growing up, I started out with that like eighties rock bass because that's what my dad really likes. So that's what I was listening to all the time. So getting sure. into like the harder stuff was a little bit easier on my end. However, I know it's like, okay, we got to, it's like, if you're going to get kids into like some of that heavier stuff, you got to enter, if, especially if they like more of a pop hip hop oriented sound, you got to ease them into it. You got to get them just growing into it. Cause all of a sudden, especially like pop punk, they're going to love the sound. They're going to love the pace behind. It, they're going to love the energy behind it. All of a sudden, they're going to start liking the instrumentation behind it as well. And they're going to look into something that has more of that instrumentation in the forefront and maybe a little bit less of that pace and energy, a little bit more of this concentrated feel, a little bit more of this power behind it that's just like, or then, Rrr. yeah, and just the deeper the growl, the further they go. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. And well, because I was thinking about this as well. Have you thought about potentially trying to like market your music or have you talked with like your label as well to potentially market music so that you get your songs more featured on something like TikTok? Just do the fact of how popular the platform is, especially with younger consumers. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of I'm running my own TikTok pretty frequently. So I've had a few little moments. Uh, I had a moment with uh, a song I put out like a couple of years ago called E-Girl, which which caught some fire on uh, TikTok. It's funny. It's like a little, you know what I mean? Like stuff like that, uh, I feel like does well on TikTok. Um, <clears throat> so it's like, you know. And that song isn't on Spotify, but it's on it's on SoundCloud, and it's got, we made a music video for it. It's on YouTube. It's really dope. It's it's pretty fucking punk, dude. It's cool, but it's uh, yeah. I don't know. I might make I might just make that free on SoundCloud to download because now I have so many people hitting up me like, dude, put it on Spotify, put it on Apple Music. But like, I have just all these other new songs that make more sense like leading up to the album. So I probably am not gonna drop it on Spotify and stuff, but. It's like that. It's like I feel like it's gonna end up being like that, like cult fan, like favorite, yeah. wh- where they're gonna be like at live shows, like play E Girl. Like it's definitely goes so hard live because it's just like just like really fucking fast punk type vibe. So it's fun. And when it comes to the move of like potentially putting out on SoundCloud as a as a free download or you know free download, pay download, whatever it might be. And not playing out on Spotify and on music because you want to lead up to the album that you're creating in a in the best way possible. I totally do understand that. And then when it comes out, it's like if you have it on SoundCloud, you know, make sure it's like, okay, it's out on SoundCloud right now. You can download it and just really promote the hell out of that too. Because then yeah. if because even if kids go and download it and that's the only thing they listen to off of you, they know the sound, they're gonna know the song, they're gonna play it around their friends, and their friends are gonna potentially start liking it, and that's when they're gonna start checking out your stuff. So there's a yeah. lot of potential. I also think it's kind of like not a lot of artists are just like, just like dropping a free download for their fans. Like, I think there's something kind of cool about that. It feels like very personal. Like I would be hyped if one of my favorite bands was like, yeah, we're just going to drop this track, like not on Spotify, like fuck the numbers. We're just going to give this to you because I know you fucking want it. And like, and then like, let's, let's rage to it at the live show. And <clears throat> I don't know. I think there's something kind of special to that. I actually saw something today. I forgot who I saw it from. It was someone on my Facebook friends list. It might have been William the Basis from Modern Day Escape. I'm not sure because I, he always puts out some a good stuff. But I can't remember who said this, but they were talking about how take a look at comedians nowadays, like guys like Burt Kreischer, Tom Segura, Bill Burr, Joe Rogan. And they're putting out all this different kind of they're putting out all this free content. I mean, you've got Burt Kreischer doing like random, like the random dance videos and just in a speedo with his gut hanging out, which is always hilarious. You got Tom Segura doing random stuff. You got Bill Burr doing his podcast, all the podcasts he does, including his own. You got the Joe Rogan podcast as well. And you're getting a lot of content and you're getting a lot of it for free as well. And it's just like some of the stuff, of course, they're capitalizing it with certain ads. But, you know, Burt Kreischer making those wacky videos. He's not, they're not, there's nothing sponsoring them. So they're not making any money off of that. However, all of a sudden, when live shows return and live, then they can go out, these comedians can go out on the road. And all of a sudden, you get a chance to go see someone like Burt Kreischer or Bill Burr, and you've been watching this content, and you're enjoying it. Hell, you're going to buy one of those tickets. Those tickets are going to run you 75, 100 bucks potentially. And yeah. that's where they're going to make their money because you want to see it and you want to actually see them live. And you're still going to laugh your ass off because you enjoy the comedy. But think about it in a music sense as well. It could be the exact same way, and not many bands are doing anything like that. So if you drop a song that's been popular for you and drop a free download on soundcloud all of a sudden people are going to gravitate towards that and even if they don't even if the numbers don't really line up because it's getting downloaded for free your name's getting out there your sound's getting out there people especially in the tiktok world are going to be talking about it hell it could be yeah. like a viral tiktok thing where all of a sudden they, they play e-girl and you're going to have a whole dance routine to it Dude, that's what I'm saying. Like uh, one video for E-Girl got like the sounds are already up on on TikTok. So like you can use the sounds because I just uploaded it straight to my phone. So like one of the first video I posted with the music video got 40,000 views. And the second one got like over 100,000. It might be 150 at this point, 150K. So um, that's that's crazy. And like I I bet if I keep posting it, people are going to be like, 
once I make it free, then because people were getting so pissed, bro. <laughs> like they were like, why is it still like when I posted it a second time, they were like, yo, I've seen this again. Like, why is this still not on? I'm like, well, let's go listen to my other music. It's on <laughs> it's on SoundCloud, bro. But I think if I have it available to download, then they'll be really hyped because then they can actually acquire it and then, you know, just pull it into iTunes or into there because you can add like downloaded songs into your Spotify library too. So, oh, oh yeah, I do that stuff all the time. I mean, I yeah. still use an iTunes library because, especially with always doing a song of the day feature every single day and having to create the 30 second videos for it, I need mm-hmm. to have that. I need to be able to download all this stuff. So, I always have that kind of getting ready to go for me. And plus, whenever I listen to music, like if I'm going and driving the car, still have the uh, good old FM transmitter in my little console. And when I'm in the Throwback. gym, that's when I've always got my, I got an old iPod that I run off of because I don't want any other outside distractions. It kind of is really nice to have that because there's times all of a sudden, like I've, there's times where I forgot my phone. They're like, oh, I should have forgot my phone. Well, I got my iPod at least. So, hey, my music's not gone. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's dope. No distractions. That's the way to go. But I mean, I'd be very curious to see, especially how the a free download, especially like make a TikTok video with it again. But then also say that, hey, you can download this song for free on SoundCloud. See how many people go to SoundCloud to download it and then really get into it. And then after that, you know, they're going to check out your stuff on Spotify. They're going to check out your stuff on Apple Music. And they're not going to see eGirl on there, but they're going to see so much other stuff. But they're going to want to know what else do you have up your sleeve. They're going to listen to something like Bar It Out. And then all of a sudden they're going to want to go into something else. They're going to want to go to the next thing. They want to go to the next thing. And it's just going to keep growing and growing at that point. They can listen to uh Still not dead. They can listen to walk away too late, whatever it might be. Yeah, man. I that's that's the plan. I'm I'm literally formulating this plan with you as we speak. So this is dope. <laughs> it's 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 something where it's it's something where I mean a lot of times like I come up with some of this stuff just because a couple of reasons. One, I what when I was in college, I was an econ major. So when it comes to like recognizing certain trends and really figuring out how to maximize that, that's really what I looked at a lot of. Um two. I listen to a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk and watch a lot of his stuff. And of course he's Mr. Yeah. Social Media, Mr. Entrepreneur. And not gonna lie, the dude's not wrong. And when it comes no. to TikTok, it's just with how big it is with the younger generation. Holy crap, do you have a huge mark you can work with? Cause I know MGK's music, especially when Tickets by Downfall came out, was really making the rounds. Yeah. Yeah, I TikTok's fun, man. I definitely there I get sometimes I'll just go like crazy, like four, four, five videos a day. Like I'm just on this like just like ideas come to me like every you know two hours and then i'll like sometimes hit a point where i'm like burnt out i'm like yeah i can't look at this app for like a day or two i need to just like take a second but which is okay like you know they you know obviously the more you post the better but like i for me it's like i'm gonna use it in the best way for me and i'm just gonna like have fun with it i'm not gonna stress about it or be too serious about it because i'm too serious about everything else so (laughs) that's the one place i could just not give a fuck and if it's your platform where you're going to be less serious about it as well, people are going to see a different side of you and it's going to maybe see a little bit more of a personal side because, yeah. hey, he's being silly, he's being goofy, he's doing, he's being more of just himself at this point and not, you know, being as serious about the stuff that he's doing with the, with the other kind with the, uh, the rest of his music, with his career. So, yeah, it's just something that people gravitate towards because it has, I'm, I mean, when it comes to the serious stuff, yes, it's going to have an authentic feel, but when it comes to the emotion of just kind of the goofiness, it's just something that people can really easily relate to and then yeah. really dive deeper into your stuff with. Yeah. And I always want to be authentic with everything. And and the thing is like, the reason I like using, I use Instagram a little bit more like for like, you know, to create, to curate the, the world and the American teeth world and the vision that I have visually for everything. And like, you know, I'm, I'm like a pretty theatrical person. So I like to like, you know, dress up and wear makeup and like do these different things and like have curate cool, like looks and like get dope fits and shit like that. So like, you know, I I like Instagram for that, but you know, what's cool about TikTok is like, yeah, I just will be like sitting here in my hoodie and just be like, what's up? And like, I was just on live, you know, I'll just like pop on and go live for like a half hour, hour sometimes and just like play music. Like before our interview, I was just like on live, just like, playing music and just like talking through this, like I was a radio DJ and like talking to people and just like being dumb. So I like doing that shit too. Okay. What, what you just said is something that absolutely makes sense. And I'll tell you why, because you're talking about TikTok, you're talking about Instagram, you're talking about Instagram, doing more of this curated stuff 
a little bit more of this creative, however, like wearing makeup, just kind of just different fits, different styles. And then also with the live feature as well, doing that again, you're getting a more personal side. However, with the live feature, you're able to do that a lot more with TikTok. You're able to make the wackier videos, be able to have a little more fun. It'll be a lot more loose. The key to that is you're looking at these two different types of social media platforms and the like the content that people expect and the content that they want to consume on those are completely different. If you're doing what you're doing on TikTok and put on Instagram, it's not going to work out nearly as effectively and vice versa. So yeah. the understanding that you're using these platforms in completely unique ways, but all for the same purpose makes absolute total sense and is really going to set you apart because there's a lot. I'm not going to lie. I do look at uh, band social accounts as well, just to see how they create certain things. And there's a lot of time where like between Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, they're all the exact same, which is fine because people are going to get the yeah. content that way. But it's all, it's three different platforms. It's three different delivery system. It's three different expectations from the crowd. So why exactly. not give them those expect, why not like curate to those expectations, create three unique pieces to the point where then all of a sudden you take a look and you're kind of focusing more on Instagram. Yeah. You could have 200,000 followers on Instagram on Facebook. You're going to have like 55,000 on Twitter. You might be under 10. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's just focusing and making sure you know how to use these platforms, which with, when it comes to Instagram, when it comes to TikTok, with this plan that you're working with, you clearly have that understanding. It's going to work. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I agree. I think that's the move. And then there's Twitter, which I also like really like because I'll just like tweet my emo thoughts and then like randomly, you know, I, I also like I have the least amount of followers on Twitter, but I think that's just because it's a it's a whole different world. And like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I know some friends who are artists who like only use Twitter. And so like they're really big on Twitter. But like I would you know, I'm less of a just type things out guy and more of a like put the video on and talk to people. And, you know, like it's just feels a little more personal to me, but, you know, to each their own. One thing we'll add to that, too, is with a lot of the bands that I've looked at when it comes to the, like their I'm going to take TikTok out of this because I'm taking a look at like when people really are focusing on, especially in a little bit more of an all around generational style with Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Twitter typically for musicians and bands has the least amount of followers across all three. Yeah, I agree with that. That's probably true. So it's, it's not something I can totally understand where it's like, yeah, you know, you could potentially be doing a lot of different things as well with Twitter. I like the fact you're constantly tweeting your emo thoughts as well, because God, it's like, especially it just, there's certain things with all of a sudden that emo nostalgia that comes back, especially for people that lived it, like really were in like that middle school, high school era between like the, like 2004 to 2009, 2010. I mean, yep. take a look at the uh, the emo's not dead videos on YouTube. I, they come out and, and people just go crazy for them because you get the nostalgia, but it's also just great content at the same point as well. But it's like, it's, yeah. especially on Twitter, if you're tweeting your emo thoughts, you're getting that nostalgia factor and you're getting that relatability factor as well because a lot of people had those thoughts or still have those thoughts, but secretly. Yeah, it's like it's like a MySpace, you know, post. Yes. <laughs> Just make sure that uh, people aren't jealous of not being in your top eight. Yeah, dude. Did you see there? Like they re they rebooted uh, MySpace. Like there's like this like underground website called Space Hey, and I actually like jumped on it right when I found out about it, and then I made a TikTok about it actually because it was like crazy. And I actually haven't been on for like probably three weeks, but like I think I have like. 300 friends on space hey right now <laughs> and really? it literally is like a resurgence of myspace they made the whole thing like almost identical it's crazy bulletins everything interesting i mean when myspace came out like it was such it was a huge thing and it's i think one of the biggest things too that a lot of people liked about it was the customization because you look at facebook it's i mean you can cut like the picture the banner of course that's custom out, but like the background of and then you, uh whenever you open up someone's uh, profile it's like you're not hearing sugar we're going down swinging anymore or not hearing situations dude. by escape the fate <laughs> dude i forgot about that just logging on to, like hitting someone's profile and then all of a sudden it's just like we're going down just like right <laughs> in, right off the bat you're like oh damn definitely forgot about that that's funny yeah i mean can you imagine if like other platforms would start doing that i mean at times it'd be like oh this is getting i can see it getting annoying however it's still pretty awesome at the same time oh yeah here i'm trying to i want you to be able to see this while we're doing it here's my profile bro um let's right. see 
For everyone uh, listening on the podcast, go over to the YouTube video to see this. Yeah. Uh, I, okay, there it is. Yeah, I got it. Oh, <laughs> oh there's my homepage. Dude, that, straight up. That is straight up my space. <laughs> dude, it's crazy. And like, obviously, yeah, even with the online thing, dude, mm -hmm. crazy. That is awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wild. Let's see. I have a hundred. Yeah, okay. I have 102 friends. Nothing crazy. But dude, people are like posting on my fucking page and shit. It's crazy. But one thing about that too is especially with those small, like a, the much smaller social media platforms. I'm not talking about Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, anything like that. But like ones that are upcoming as well. You never know which one is going to hit. I mean, TikTok started out as musically. And yeah. that was like, it was like a thing that was big with like 10 year olds, like in 2016, 2017. And all of a sudden yeah. they switched, they changed over to TikTok. And I mean, TikTok is now one of the biggest things. Take a look yeah. at, um, I'll use Twitter as an example as well. I mean, not many people jumped on Twitter, but the people that jumped on Twitter early, especially in a, like a more, uh, like performance setting or like a celebrity setting. I'm gonna use Ashton Kutcher as an example. He was the first person to ever get a million followers on Twitter. Oh, was he? Okay. Yeah. That's cool. And it's just, it's just, especially like 2009 to 2014, like I was seeing Ashton Kutcher almost everywhere just because he was, it, it was in the minds of people because people are starting to flock to those social media sites and all of a sudden, oh my God, they're taking advantage of it. And other celebrities will come in as well and really start to pick up on the platform. However, they could have been so much bigger had they jumped on it first. Take a look at Instagram. Yep. I'll use Instagram as another example because one of the first people to jump on Instagram was The Rock posting all those uh, workout videos that he had. And I mean, he's like the most followed guy on Instagram. The Rock, hell yeah. I mean, it doesn't also hurt that he is like in, it seems like three or four movies every single year, has a couple of TV shows and also then lays the smacketh down on people. Yeah, dude, he's, he's a, a true legend. Oh, absolutely. But again, going back to uh, Space Hay, where, it, again, when it comes to the whole entire music scene, it could potentially start really focusing in more on, you know, going back to like what MySpace originally had when it was in Hayday, like really focusing on more of the alternative music scene, indie scene, get more, with more of the emo stuff, more of the pop punk stuff, especially with the MGK tickets my downfall, but it's kind of feeling a little bit more of that resurgence right now. If they jump onto that and that resurgence really starts to hit, all of a sudden, Space A could really start to pick up again. All of a sudden, you're going to have MySpace 2.0. And if you're on there originally, you're the one making content for it. Of course, people jumping on it right away, that's what they're going to see. So then all of a sudden, they're going to start following your stuff. As more people jump on, yeah, you're going to have more stuff to compete with. However, people are still focusing on your stuff because that's what's coming up first when they first jump on for the first time ever. Log on for the first time ever. Create their profile, whatever it may be. Hell, I could probably go on Space Hey right now create a profile, see what happens. And yours might be the first one that comes up as a suggested uh, friend or follower, whatever it might be. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Cause it's pretty randomly generated. And I was in the forums, like when I was on it, like there was probably a week where I was on it like every day and I was in the forums and people were like uh, talking to the creator and the creator's like, yeah, we're making a, we're going to start beta for like a music whole music session or section. So anyone who wants to apply to be a part of it, shoot me a message so I, I you know of course i applied i was like fuck it so i haven't heard anything about it yet but who knows man you just never know so it's like i, I always like to jump on things early just to see what if it's gonna do anything yeah and it makes total sense too because if it doesn't work out well then you tried and you know the answer to it however yeah. if it does work out and it becomes one of the bigger platforms especially coming into the 2020s I mean, you you could be the first mover. You could be the, you could be the first one there, and that is a huge advantage in the long run. I could be the next Ashton Kutcher. The next Ashton Kutcher. You could be the next Rock. You could be the next. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the stuff people from uh, MySpace days. You could be like the next Andy Black at that point, where all of a sudden, like you're really starting to get a follow on a following on that platform, and all of a sudden, everyone gravitates towards the music, and then all of a sudden, boom! I know that Black Veil Brides is a very polarizing band with a lot of people. However. They're still very well known. They're still playing on music and there's still a lot of people that listen to it, myself included. For sure. I'm trying to think of some other people that really like blew Tom up from on MySpace. Me. That could, I could be the next Tom from MySpace. <laughs> You're gonna have to change your your profile picture to have be like 
the same kind of like style that you had it with on space, uh, space A, but you got to have a like a, a board in the back, like sending you the green lighting on there, the green yeah. lighting with the board, but then also you have to like be sitting to the sideways and like thumbs up to like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or, or I could just put my head on, like, take the Tom picture and put my <laughs> head with, like, my hairstyle and shit just, like, right on Tom. And, like, that's my profile. Maybe I should do that next. You honestly, that's not a bad idea just with that's how fire. people. I'm emo Tom. <laughs> <laughs> with, I'll say this, with the way people absolutely love this, the wackiest memes you can think of, honestly, just the crude pasting of your face over Tom's face could absolutely work. It could hit, man. <laughs> I, when it comes to doing like a lot of the uh, podcast preview videos for the pod, the, uh, the corporate progression podcast, like the run up videos that I have, I do that a lot where all of a sudden like, oh, here's a, I'm putting someone's face over someone else's face. And then something's happening. Like with um, when I interviewed Lance from, from Ashes to New, because the dude's big into anime, I took one where it was a Naruto fight and I put his face over Naruto. And all of a sudden, whoever Naruto was beating up, my logo went over that guy's face. Nice. And then also I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, then I took uh, from from the original Pokemon series when Ash meets Gengar, Hunter and Ghastly. And they're like trying to like basically be the three stooges. But Lance's face over Gengar. I put Danny Case's face over Hunter and he ends up hitting Danny Case in the head. And all of a sudden they start like going up and down. <laughs> it was <laughs> it's it, it it's wacky. It's just like it's kind of crudely pasted. However, it's it's just hilarious. That's what you're going for. I'm not going for anything like, oh, this is super serious. No, it's funny. To you gotta get you have to, fun with it, man. It's funny to get you to laugh and then get you to, hey, what other kind of videos are there out there? Because I always do two for every single episode. That's sick. So again, it's just kind of that thought process. And I love the fact you have that thought process behind always willing to try something new when it comes to promoting your music and being able to get out there in front of the fans, whether it might be fans that are older, you know, 30s and 40s that like kind of have that like, a, like original pop punk flavor to them. Or people that are, you know, my age, you know, mid twenties, it's like, okay, you know, like a bunch of random stuff. And especially the younger generation as well, because give it five, 10 years, that's a generation that's really going to be driving a lot what's going on in culture. So totally. if you're in their minds and all of a sudden they, they get into the prominence when they are saying, not if, when they get into prominence, you're going to be in their minds. You're going to be the one they're listening to in terms of music. So all of a sudden, when you take a look at the aftershock lineup, you're not going to be the one that's on the you're gonna you're gonna be on there, but you're not gonna be the one that's on there on the bottom. You're gonna be a lot closer to the top. That's right. Look at us go talk about strategy, music biz strategy. So, like I said with the podcast, like I, the conversation always based around the music, but I never know what the hell I'm actually gonna get myself into, and I love it every step of the way, just because I always have the most random conversations, but they're always absolutely incredible every step of the way. Yeah, man, I think it's a cool look into the into the life. Plus, plus also getting different perspectives as it on it as well, especially when I'm bringing it up as well, because coming from a fan's perspective, a lot of people are going to have that perspective, but it's also like a fan's perspective that also focuses a lot more on this stuff because that's what I do. And then talking with you from an artist perspective, from the other side of that and really understanding both sides and all of a sudden figuring out like, okay, this, as an artist, you can do this. And this is how the fan mindset would think about that and react to it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a cool, uh, Look at the perspectives there. Yeah, the contrast. It's like I'm trying to think. Like it's like some weird Twilight Zone kind of stuff, but <laughs> it's real. And that is absolutely awesome. And taking a look at the time right now, because I know it's like between hour, hour and a half, about like that hour, hour, fifteen minute mark. And bef- and I think it's a good way to end it as well, just due to the fact that we really went through a lot with the kind of just promoting yourself on social media as well as an artist and really getting behind that and really understanding the nuance behind that, especially when it comes to like TikTok and Instagram. Yeah, man. And I love the fact again, weird shit. (laughs) What was that? I said, follow me on TikTok. I do weird shit. Oh, don't worry because (laughs) this is what I always do for every single podcast. And it's basically for everyone listening. And you guys know, I do this. I know you want to follow American Teeth. I know you want to know everything that Elijah is up to. I know you want to continue to listen to more of his stuff. I don't really get that much deep into it. But if you listen to Bard Out, I definitely suggest that you do. And I did go dive deep into it. I even have my little overall little uh, fun thing for it. And it kind of actually fits in with this podcast as well. But when it comes down to following him on all this stuff, wherever I can find him, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Apple Music, Spotify, 
SoundCloud so that if you put e-girl out as a free download, everyone can check that out. I'll have yeah. all the links in the description for the podcast. So whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, podcast, Google Play, iHeartRadio, you're going to see the link that say follow American Teeth or find American Teeth online, and I'm going to have everything there. I love it. And for everyone listening as well, when it comes to barred out, I want to give you the whole entire over, like little overall thing so that you guys get a little bit of an understanding about where I'm coming from when you think of it. And overall, when I listen to the song, I uh, looked at more of that pop rock mix with the metal, like the metal that the younger generation really get into. And this is another version that could really take off and help rock and metal grow with that younger audience with what barred out has. Again, we talked about that a lot on the podcast and this song really does have it. Because there's a slower, subtle build on the vocals and on the instrumentals here. It's incredibly smooth. And the electronic synth that is really prominent here really helps keep this all connected very fully. It's an interest, it's it is interesting, don't get me wrong, but it's a move that absolutely worked out. And I can see why Fearless Records picked up American Teeth off of this because it's something that is definitely prepping them for a massive run in the future. I mean, heck, they're on the aftershock lineup. So there's definitely build something building there. It's like a fire that is smoldering beneath the surface. And all of a sudden, before you know it, it's going to, it's just going to absolutely become this gigantic explosion. But by, so here's my question for you. Do you want to see the explosion happen or you just want to show up afterwards? Because let me tell you, when you see that stuff happens, it's a lot cooler. I want to see it happen. I want to be on top of the volcano and surf the lava down to the bottom. <laughs> I'm, th- I'm not sure if there's a board that would actually hold up while surfing down on lava, but we got to make one. What do you think? Like a carbon fiber board, maybe? I don't know. I don't know, but uh, if you could if you could make that happen, that'd be absolutely insane. That'd be, that would be the best TikTok, dude. If that didn't go viral, I, I think TikTok is dead. Uh, just just don't fall off the board and fall in the lava. I mean, you have to be, ve- you have to be very confident that you're going to be able to pull that off. Yeah, it's it's kind of like it's that's even more risky than skydiving, honestly. It it really is. <laughs> and I love just, skydiving. I've only gone once and it was it was interesting. I love the feel of it, but then the harness that I was wearing was way too tight, so when I landed I couldn't feel my legs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're like because I had to tandem jump. They're like, "Pick your legs up." I'm like, "I can't feel them, guys." <laughs> <laughs> I have no legs. Pretty much, yeah. It was, it was, I would definitely go again. I, I do, I would like to jump by myself at one point. Cause all of a sudden I just jump and next thing you know, it's like, okay, stay straight. No, I'm doing a flip. Whee! Yeah. Yeah. I, I always see like people who jump alone, they'll go in groups and like do like stars, like hold hands and like flip and spin. It's like, it looks sick. <laughs> Pretty sure if I end up holding hands and in a star, I just start singing some random song and just yeah. no one would hear it but me though, which would be fun. Yep. That sounds fun. Oh, but Elijah, as we close this one out, I always like to give the featured guests on the podcast a chance to say whatever they want as we close this out, whatever they want to plug, whatever they want to say, whatever they want to do. So the floor is yours, man. The future is bright, baby. (laughs) Yeah, let's, uh, yeah, I'm just going to be optimistic and say the future is bright and I can't wait to see everybody out at a live show. It's going to be crazy. And now it's my turn and I've got three things I want to close this out with first or four things. First things first. Yes, the future is bright. There is a COVID-19, there's multiple COVID-19 vaccines out there. They're being rolled out as we speak. So let's make sure that we beat this thing so that we can get back to live shows that Aftershock Fest can happen along with all the other musical festivals that are happening in 2021. And then we can all get back to doing what we love, which is Playing, co- or playing shows, attending those shows, getting the mosh pit, potentially breaking you know mel- multiple bones in your body, getting multiple cuts to your face like I usually do. Whatever it might be, whatever makes us happy. Let's make that happen. Secondly, again, a reminder, when it comes to finding American Teeth online with everything that is humanly possible, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Space. Hey, yes, I'm going to try and find that and put the link on there as well. YouTube, where if if, if if you got a website and you got merch, I'm finding it. I'm putting it down there as well. Spotify, Apple Music. I'm putting the SoundCloud thing there as well so that you guys can download eGirl if American Teeth and Elijah make it possible for you to download that so you guys can listen to it. So making that all happen. And I got two more things. The last one is, well, I usually have this little thing I have called the First Rounds on Me Club that I created here with the podcast. and. It goes like this. Elijah, when, and this is a when, I see you live for the first time. First round's on me. Can't wait.
What's it going to be? What are we going to drink? Whatever you want, man. Tequila. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'll bring the good shit. Fuck yeah. So on that note, I cannot in good conscience end this podcast with a goodbye because that seems like it is the end all be all of it. And that's just not a good way to end it. So Elijah, I got to end it with this. See you later, man. See you later, bro. Well, well, folks, that was my interview with Elijah from American Teeth. And when it comes to American Teeth Online, again, take a look at the description of the podcast. I have everything there for you. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Space Hey, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, where you can find American Teeth Online and website, merch, whatever it might be. If you have, like any sort of that like pop rock infusion kind of stuff. This is definitely a band that you're going to want to check out. Elijah's incredibly talented. I I suggest you check out all of his stuff. And really when it comes down to it, like I said, when it comes down to this band, they're going to be one of those bands that, especially with the way things are going in 2021, they have potential to really explode in the next coming years in terms of popularity. Now, my question to you is this, do you want to be there when the explosion happens or do you want to show up to just see the aftermath? Me? I want to be there when it happens, and I hope you do too. So on that note, that's me for me today, guys. Thank you for watching and listening to the Chord Progression Podcast. by the city rocks for rock and metal thrive. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I am. Every single one is up to the big, healthy, and hearty. See ya! Yeah! Oh.